By 1915, the First World War was really beginning to heat up. More and more countries were becoming tangled up in the bloodshed, and it wouldn't be long before the entire globe would be at each other's throats. Many Europeans who'd moved abroad desperately wanted to fight for their countries, or help turn the tide in their favour by committing acts of espionage. However, as it turned out, not everyone who wanted to help was quite cut out to be a spy. After Britain joined the war in 1914, many other countries that were part of the British Empire also ended up joining shortly after and aiding in the front lines. When Japan also joined the war shortly after as an ally of Britain, Germany began to get concerned. As Canada was part of the British Empire, not only could they send their own troops and supplies, but also help transport Japanese troops from the Pacific across Canada, where they could join Canadian troops on their way to the Western Front. Germany was convinced this was going to happen, and as such, ordered the Canadian railway system be disrupted. This order was answered by a Mr. Werner Horn, a German Army Reserve Lieutenant who'd been managing a coffee plantation in Guatemala. He had tried to return to Germany at the outbreak of the war, but ended up stuck in New York due to the British blockade of the North Sea. As his old plantation had found a new manager, he found work at another plantation in Chiapas before getting a card officially ordering him to return to Germany in December. On his way back, he met Franz von Papen in New York, the military attaché of the German embassy in Washington. Papen had formulated a plan to sabotage the St. Croix Vanceboro railway bridge that crossed the border between Canada and the US and was looking for willing volunteers volunteers to do it. The US was strictly neutral during the outbreak of the war, having forbid Canada from transporting troops or wartime supplies through US soil. The Canadian Pacific was still allowed to use their line travelling through Maine. Despite using it to carry troops and supplies, because they weren't being loaded or unloaded on US soil, the US simply turned a blind eye. Many in Germany objected to this practice, but the complaints seemed to fall on deaf ears. Papen butted up Horn by telling him destroying the bridge would be viewed as an act of valour in Germany, and that he'd be a hero for disrupting enemy supply lines while not having to kill anyone. On top of this, despite being a major supply route, the bridge was unguarded as nobody expected a little nowhere town in Maine to be a significant military target. Horn was sold, and so Papen paid him $700 to destroy the bridge. Horn had never received any official kind of training to be a spy, but figured how hard could it be. And in late January of 1915, he put the plan into action. He acquired a load of dynamite, which he packed into a suitcase and hopped aboard an overnight train to Boston, which continued to Maine. I would like to stress that not only was he carrying dynamite on a passenger train, but he also slept with it in his bed compartment on the trip. When he arrived in Vanceboro, he checked into a nearby hotel and got straight to work and immediately raised suspicion when he was spotted hiding the suitcase in a pile of wood before scouting out the bridge. After three Vanceboro residents reported him for suspicious behaviour, he was questioned by a US immigration inspector. Horn informed the inspector he was merely a Danish farmer looking to buy land in the area, and spent the next two days laying low and keeping a note of the Canadian Pacific schedule. Once he had all the information he needed, he was ready to do the deed. Late at night on the 1st of February 1915, he checked out of his hotel saying he needed to catch a train, and set off for the bridge. He changed into a German army uniform to prevent himself from being labelled as a spy in the event he got caught, an offence he could be executed for. As prepared as he was to pull off the bombing, what he wasn't prepared for was the weather. Not only was it extremely cold that night, with temperatures as low as minus 34 degrees Celsius, but extremely windy too. He reached the bridge around midnight and got ready to set the explosives in place, only to be interrupted by a train thundering past. He waited for a moment for it to be all clear before continuing to work on the explosives, only to be interrupted again by yet another train. Horn, despite being an enemy spy willing to fight for the fatherland, armed with roughly 60 pounds of dynamite and about to destroy enemy infrastructure, really didn't want to hurt anyone with this explosion. As such, he waited a while in the freezing gale to make sure no more trains were coming before continuing. It was seven minutes past one in the morning by the time he had placed the bomb. He cut the fuse and lit it with a cigar before hurrying away to the same hotel he had checked out of earlier. The 
hotel proprietor saw how badly frostbitten Horn was and allowed him to check back in for the night. Because the Horn had cut the fuse, the dynamite exploded after only three minutes at ten past one, blowing out windows across Vanceborough and St. Croix, exposing many residents to the cold, harsh winds outside. The blast was so powerful it left the bridge relatively intact. Only a few iron beams were twisted out of shape, and upon inspection the next day, the damage to the bridge was found to be relatively minor. Frankly, the bomb seemed to have caused more damage to its surroundings than to its target. It didn't take long for the hotel proprietor to connect the explosion with Horn reappearing in the middle of the night half frozen. The sheriff of Vanceboro and two Canadian police officers detained Horn at the hotel, Horn having changed into his uniform again to prevent spy charges. As he was arrested on US soil, he was tried by the US courts first, where he signed a confession. Because the explosion happened on the Canadian side of the bridge, the most the court could charge him with was carrying explosives on a public train. He was sentenced to 18 months in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary in Georgia. Afterwards, he was extradited to Canada in 1919, where he was tried for attempting to blow up the bridge. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but was released and sent back to Germany in 1921 after being deemed insane. In reality, he was suffering from syphilis. What happened to him afterwards isn't really known. The bridge, meanwhile, was only out of service for a few days before it was quickly repaired. Not only was Horn's attempt to serve the fatherland a fantastic demonstration of how not to be a spy, but in the long term led to the US cracking down on possible German spies. The fact von Papen, an official German ambassador, managed to orchestrate this attack showed the US that despite being neutral, they still weren't safe, or worse, were inadvertently helping German spies orchestrate attacks on Canada. Eventually, the US started sending supplies to the Allied countries, and finally joined the war in 1917. Looking back, Werner Horn's attempt to blow up the Vanceboro Bridge is frankly a comical example that not everybody is cut out to be a spy. From carrying explosives in public, to getting caught several times acting suspiciously, to failing to achieve his goal in the first place, it'd be fair to say he wasn't exactly the best the fatherland had to offer in terms of espionage ability. So remember, if you're ever offered the chance to get in on some secretive spying skullduggery, maybe think twice before playing James Bond, as you may end up acting a bit more Austin Powers. Subscribe for more.